it's our responsibility to help like our culture, to help the human race, mm-hmm. you know, to, to move forward because we need to be that example. We have the power and like we have the ability to express ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's saying so much. It's not how you love. It's not who you love. It's being love. I can't take no loss. Huh. I don't even know what it costs. Huh. I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, I can't take no loss. Yeah. I don't even know what it costs. Yeah, I hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, hit the ground and it go off. Yeah, yeah, run it, run it. Ooh. I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah, yeah. I really feel it's my time. Think it's my year. Yeah. What's up, everyone? I'm Jason Naylor, Brooklyn-based artist. Today on the Live Through Love podcast, we talk about love, we talk about kindness, we talk about darkness. I share a couple of pointers on how to move through darkness and back into the color and the light and positivity. A couple of laughs and a really good time. Let's go. Jason. My man. Thanks for coming in, man. Dude, I'm so happy to be here. I'm happy this worked out. I'm happy that you're here in Santa Monica in their studio because yep. you live on the East Coast, yep. right? You're you're my brother on the East Coast spreading love and optimism and positivity. Yes, sir. And living life in color. Yes, sir. So just tell me a little bit about you. So, well, I'm an artist, as you know. Uh, I'm based in Brooklyn. I have a mission of spreading love. And my art is all about kindness, positivity, joy. I do it through the lens of color. So everything I do is in full color. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been working professionally as an artist for about 10 years. Before that, I worked as a graphic designer. And um, that's kind of that's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of my life. My generally my my life is focused on my mission. Mm -hmm. So everything I do kind of ties back to the mission. And in a way, I think that's really like amazing and beautiful way to live life because keeping my my personal life on brand has become kind of a thing as well. Yeah. So like it's not just my work is about spreading love, it's about like my existence mm-hmm. is about spreading love. So it's been it's been an awesome journey and I'm I'm happy that it led me here. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And and what I'm hearing is like you want the congruency of who you are in life, who you are in social media, who you are in career all to be one person. Yes. Exactly. And that's easy to say. You know, um, but I think it's like it's convenient for for you and me when the mission is to spread love. Mm-hmm. It's easy to, to make sure that you're doing that in your work and at home. You know, it's like if if the mission was something different, then you might have to keep them separate. Yeah. For us, it's easy to be like, this is just me night and day. Yeah. Let's help humanity be good, positive, loving and remember that that's what we are. That's what we're made from. And that's who we should be at all times. Yeah. And it's funny that. I mean, of course, this is like part of the reason for my mission and your mission. It's funny that we have to have this mission, you know, but but here we are. Right. Go figure. We have missions showing humans that it's okay to be human. Yeah. And to operate out of love. Right. So basic. Right. Yeah. So specifically, I say live through love. Yeah. How do you define your specific way of spreading love and positivity? So my mine is uh, defined by the phrase open your heart. Mm-hmm. And I have a character called open heart. And the, the actual heart is a heart that has a hole in it. And the hole is not meant to be like an emptiness. The hole is meant to be like there's room for more. Mm. So open your heart. There's always room for more love. And it goes beyond just opening your heart. For me, it's like open your arms, open your eyes, open your mind to understanding new things, like open up your schedule, open up your time, you know, open your heart. Mm. And so I I try to do everything through that lens. And then visually, I use the heart in all my work. So it could be like it's very subtly integrated. It could be the the art itself. It could be a character like my vinyl toy. Mm And the heart is is a prevalent way of saying like, you know, this is the mission, but I like to integrate it in a way that fits the project. Some projects don't need a big heart on them and mm-hmm. some need just the heart. Mm-hmm. What I'm also liking about that, having opening your mind to other opinions, mm-hmm. other points of views mm-hmm. and not casting judgment that it's OK that someone has a different opinion. Just be open to that. Yeah. And let's meet in the middle. Like, do you love? I love. Right. Let's just go there. Well, that's what I, I mean, that's what's so great about like the concept of love, right? It doesn't, love doesn't mean 
sharing an opinion. It doesn't mean being the same person. It doesn't mean looking the same or feeling the same. It means like accepting, tolerating, allowing, you know, like mm-hmm. these other things that I think are so, so crucial to love. And that, that's why open heart, I think is a good way to, to capture all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not a rom-com. It's not a hallmark moment. Right. Yeah. So what, what led you here though? So you were a graphic designer, right? You worked for Mac cosmetics. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, that is, that is a creative skill set in itself because people ask me sometimes, Hey, will you design the flyer or the poster? I'm like, I am not a graphic designer. I am not a graphic. I want to school to be a doctor. I, I hack my way through Photoshop, but how does that play a role into dealing with corporate opinions and having them kind of really dictate your art and the transition of when you left, like, this is my art now, this is who I am. This is the only thing I'm sharing. Well, first of all, we got to go back to you being a doctor. (laughs) (laughs) I got to hear more about that. Um, Working, working as a graphic designer. I mean, I, I studied to be a graphic designer Mm -hmm. and that, and like going to school, learning graphic design, that doesn't necessarily teach you how to use software. And it also doesn't teach you how to like deal with corporate America, you know, but you figure out the software. And once you start working as a designer, you figure out corporate America. So what you learn in school is how to think in terms of design principles and design is about simplification Mm -hmm. and communication. Right. And so I think similar to art, I mean, art is more about expression. In my opinion, art, you know, art is trying to express design is trying to communicate Mm -hmm. and expression and communication can be the same, Mm -hmm. but are not necessarily always the same. Right. Um, so getting to the tools, like, you know, I worked at Mac as a graphic designer, corporate America, I big picture. I didn't love going to the same desk every day and sitting at the same computer every day and having the same meetings every week. Like mm-hmm. that, that routine wasn't for me, but what I learned was there, there's a system and there's a, you know, a chain of command. There's this, there are these systems in place. And if you learn how to, if you understand them and learn how to work within them, you can accomplish things. So how that helps as an artist now, like after graduating from corporate America, I, I feel like, first of all, I'm confident with interacting, you know, with art directors and creative mm-hmm. directors and, and people who sign my paychecks, right? Yeah. I'm confident interacting with them because of my experience as a designer. And I also understand that if you work and play to the chain of command, you can accomplish things, you know? Mm-hmm. So like, for just for, for an example, like what that means is, let's say you want to put up a mural, right? You can't just, well, you can just go paint the mural, but the way to do it legitimately is to figure out who owns the property, right? Mm-hmm. And then show the person who owns the property what you'd like to do mm-hmm. on their property. And you'll find how easily they'll be like, oh, that's amazing. Let's do it, you know, as opposed to um, maybe asking the person, like, can I paint your property? Like, there's just little nuances of how yeah. you can interact with the system in order to get things accomplished. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I learned a lot of that from Mac, from corporate America, you know, and from the full-time world. Yeah. Cause there was a time, I remember when I started doing murals, I just thought if I can show you what I want you to paint, you don't have to think too hard, whether it's a yes or a no. So I would superimpose the work on walls. Right. And look, no one taught me to be a muralist. I'm like, I feel I was in sales for a really long time. Let me help make the sale. Yes. Now it's a common knowledge. People are like, oh, let me see your rendering. Can you mock it up on the wall? Can we see it? Which makes the decision easier. Totally. But getting to that point and then realizing, try to show them everything and then you get the yes. Yeah. You know, what's funny. Like, so you mentioned sales because I think a lot of what we do is sales and like, I don't like that word sales, but really the, like the idea of showing someone your work and expecting them just to fall in love with it based on the way it looks like that's artists thinking like artists, you know, other artists look at work and fall in love with it based on the way it looks, Mm -hmm. but the rest of the world, I'm I'm making two little groups. There's the artists and there's the world, right? The rest of the world, they, they don't fall in love with it based on how it looks. They need to hear about it and they need Mm -hmm. to understand it. And generally that's a process of selling, right? Mm -hmm. For lack of a better way to say it. So well, storytelling and communication. Yeah. So you can put up your art, but now how do you move someone to agree with 
letting you put up your art or sharing your work or putting it out there, right. not just or throwing it in it. someone's face. Yeah. And then you tell the story. This is what this means. This is why I want to do it. Plus, if we're dealing as creators with corporate America and egos and stuff, they want to know what the ROI is. Yeah. And just, hey, this is the impact I've created with my work. Yep. Let's do something together. I align with your brand. You align with my brand. Right. We're here. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. And and also, like, when you, you mentioned the ROI, which I think is huge to understand because there's also a lot of money at stake here too. You know, like if you're working with a corporation, they're spending money on marketing or advertising or whatever the use is. Mm -hmm. And so they want to know that if they're going to spend X dollars, that they're going to see a return on those dollars. Right. And so by communicating and telling the story and also understanding that they need that, mm -hmm. I think it, it helps us to, to get ahead, you know, and, and to have success. Mm -hmm. and, and then, so two other things I want to let's, cause I want to take this straight into something popped into my head. The concept of selling out. Yeah, okay. I don't know if you've heard it before. Mm -hmm. I've heard a lot about it in the space. A lot of people talk about it. Or like graffiti kids on the street will come vandalize a mural and bomb it because they think that the artist sold out, got paid tons of money, and just came in and enc en encroached on their territory, mm -hmm. which in most cases wasn't the case at all. Right. So how do you deal with that topic or that concept? I mean, it's a great topic. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, let's give a shout, though, first to all the graffiti artists out there who did, like, blaze this trail oh, yeah. for us, you know? And I think both of us are in a position to be able to say thank you to the people who did, like, pay those dues. And mm -hmm. I know that, like, you and I, we come in and do what we do without having to have gone through, like, getting arrested and, and all that other shit mm -hmm. because people have, like, blazed that path for us. So I, I want to just take a second and say, like, to all those people who do that and have done that, like, we fucking love you. Like, oh, yeah. That's fine. Yeah. They're, they're, they're our, our mentors. They yeah. are the trailblazers. Yeah. And a lot of that originated in, in New York. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's it's cool that we can um, uh, express gratitude to the people who do that. Um, but in terms of the idea of selling out, like, uh, you know, the the my immediate reaction to that phrase selling out is to just cross off the, the second word. Like I'm not selling out, I'm selling mm -hmm. like that. So why would you, why would you, um, and I'm not saying that I, I even use that phrase selling out, but like, why would, why would the phrase selling as an artist be a negative thing? Like if you own a restaurant, like you, if you sold out that night, you sold out, like if you drop a product or something and you, and you sell it out, like you, you sold all your product. Yeah. Like how is this like been or, or, or how is this spinning into a negative thing when it's talking about an artist creating something? Cause any other time that something is sold out, that's a win. Right. Right. Those so shoes just dropped to sell out. I didn't get mine. Dude. Right? So yeah, man, it's just, it's just, it's funny to me. So for me, it's like, if the, if the art, if someone is saying the artist is selling out that I'm like, well, they're selling, like, that's what matters. And for me, being able to pay rent and like take care of myself with my passion, mm -hmm. that is the win. So it doesn't matter if it's like, you know, if I sell out all the product or it doesn't matter if you want to say someone's a sellout, what matters to me is I'm making every day, like making a living every day, making every day matter with my passions, with mm -hmm. my dreams, with my talents, like it's a huge su success and a huge win for me. And so I'm thrilled, you know, yeah, it doesn't and, matter what you call it. And you're proving that you can live, operate and thrive as an artist. Right. And I think the term is really coming from a place of fear, mm -hmm. from a place of scarcity and, and even jealousy. Yeah. I, mean, I, I Yeah. I think the, the jealousy, like the envy is a big part of that. You know, I think an artist who sees another artist having success, and this is human nature too. This is not just about art. Totally. Like if you see someone else doing something similar to what you do and they're having what you've decided is success and you're not having that, then deep down, are you feeling like you're not hustling enough or you're not working as hard as you'd like to, or you're not living up to the potential that you know you have mm -hmm. deep down and therefore you feel envy? Because in my opinion, like if you're, if you're living the way you want to live, you know, if you're being authentic with like what your goals are, what your tasks are, what your day to day looks like, if, if all those things are in alignment, you're not going to be bummed at someone else's success. Mm -hmm. You're going to be, you're going to be able to celebrate their success because you'll know that if they can have it, so can you, because you're living up to your potential. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's to your point, like there is a lot of envy that drives that, that phrase, mm -hmm. that sentiment. Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean, what you're saying right now is spot on. 
and and the reason why right now we're t- obviously we're two artists, but some of these terms weigh heavier on artists, right? The, the other phrase that I hate is the starving artist. Right. You know, I have people that meet me and they're like, oh, so you're not a starving artist. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, that's, is, I'm like, uh, that's just not fair. It's just, what are you thinking in the world and what are you looking at all artists about? And then that's when they start either trying to negotiate or, well, you know, can you do it for this much? I'm like, you know, paint costs twice as much as what you just offered. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I don't know why there's been this. I think there's a reverse renaissance right now in artist community. Mm-hmm. Because if we look at the past, I've, I've had the pleasure of going to Machu Picchu. And the emperor used to have all the artists and scientists and politicians. Like all these people were of the highest esteem. Mm-hmm. But for some reason, somewhere, I think artists and craftsmen and people that really worked with their hands kind of were down the wayside for some reason. Right. But I think it's making a huge renaissance right now and a recovery. I hope so. I mean, I I think the starving artist stereotype is a bummer, but it's it's interesting that it's like in a way we need it because it empowers us to to uh, like drive up prices and value. Because if there was a standardized pricing mm-hmm. for art, then I think that would even it out. And I, I don't want any artist to not be able to make a living. Mm-hmm. But I, I do think that if we can like spin it into a positive thing for us, it's like, okay, but be, because people don't know what art costs, they're going to try and drive it down. But also because people don't know what art costs, we can drive up the value. Mm-hmm. So we can spin it to empower our, our profession, you know? And I try to look at it that way because first of all, um, if you went into a restaurant and you were like, I'll have the steak and they're like, Oh, it's, you know, and you're like, you know what, let me give you, I'll give you half. Yeah. <laughs> like they would, it would be like a joke, yeah. you know? Or like if you go to the doctor and uh, I mean, obviously we've all gotten a bill from the doctor and been like, no way. Yeah. Like, like what did you do? Like you, the dude didn't, I didn't even see you and you just sent me a bill. Like, yeah. come on. And then you won't, it's like, you want to get on the phone and be like, all right, let's, let's work this out. But there is no working this out. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you can't get food for half off at a restaurant. Like it's just, there, there are systems in place that stand in the way of that. But with art, there is no standardized system. Right. So then you say like, Oh, I'll I'll paint a mural or this painting is going to cost X dollars. And and they're like, Oh, I'll give you a a fourth of that. And you're like, no dude, like that's the, the paint costs a fourth of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So because of that, like, uh, lack of, I think maybe it's, let's call it mystique because of that mystique. I think we can spin that into making sure that the art has the value that we want it to have. And that's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, there's, there's a freedom in that and there's a power in that if we look at it the right way. Yeah, I agree. It's also like, I mean, look at it as an athlete. Why do some get a hundred million dollars and others get the minimum? They're all pros. Mm Mm-hmm. But then it's everything else you're putting into it. So just like art, if you try to be the best that you can, you show up the best way you can and you start commanding the value. You're in a lot of that control as well and owning it. Mm-hmm. So if we start spinning it and owning our self-worth and owning our respect toward ourselves and our putting our value out there. But I think it goes double sided. You don't want to just say, yeah, this painting's a hundred million dollars <laughs> right. and then never sell a piece of art. You know, don't make it a dollar, but find something in the middle and grow over time. Yes. Yes. And I think like to your point, I think the advice is, especially for, for the artists, right? For all of us who are artists, the advice is none of us have to starve. We can all win. And it starts with us as a group, like as a community saying like our work has value Mm -hmm. and let's not devalue our work and ourselves by selling something for less than, than the, the time and effort we put into it just so that we can do X or pay rent. You know, there, it's like, it's like you, 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 you had a, a ring that your mom handed down to you or something and you're, you're broke and you can't make rent. So you sell it for a fourth of the cost or whatever, just so mm-hmm. you can pay rent. Like obviously people are in that predicament and that's mm-hmm. okay. But as a community, if we all agree that like our work has value, our time has value, our talents have value, and we're going to uphold those together, mm-hmm. then we can make this renaissance happen, you know? No, I agree. And there's one more thing to add to that, which is respecting those that have already invested in you, supported you, purchased from you, and not start undercutting the past for, for whatever reason. Right. Good point. Yeah. So... You know, I could say this about me. I could say this about you from what I see. We obviously don't do it for just making money. Right. We have these greater missions. Right. And like I've had some 
amazing stories that I've heard across people just seeing me paint or posting in front of a mural and writing a caption and just like really deep, vulnerable shares. And that's what really keeps me going and moving mm-hmm. into the space. I'd love to hear some of the messages that you've received and the impact that you've created. Yeah. I mean, I love that you bring that up because that I often say that like the, the biggest motivating force behind the work is the impact that it has on people. And mm-hmm. the, the beauty of social media is that it's, it's the portal for us. Like we, we're allowed to like we're privileged to know the impact that it's having because people can contact us, you know? And I think that's, that's what's so special about social media because, you know, 10 years ago, if you did something that someone loved, they didn't have a way of hitting you up to say, I love this. And it can be that simple. Mm -hmm. Someone messaging you or like, I'll speak for myself, receiving a, a DM from someone that says, I love your work. Like that's my whole day right there. I'm like, boom, like I'm, I am flying the rest of the day. Like I can accomplish everything on this list today because I got that message. Mm -hmm. And the truth is I get a lot of those messages and I need them. Like I, I thrive on them and I'm not saying that I do the work for those messages, but I'm saying that because I receive validation Mm -hmm. through those messages from people, I feel the, the motivation to continue, you know, and there are times when I do have a creative slump or I do feel bummed or like, I'm a very upbeat, positive person. You Mm -hmm. can see it in my work, but I also feel down sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like I feel I have dark moments, you know? And so in order to like move through, it's a roller coaster, right? But to keep moving through it, I I use the feelings that I get from those messages. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, like the biggest ones I get are mental health related Mm -hmm. and, um, doing murals that say something like you are not alone, for example, that generates a lot of, um, vo- I think vulnerability, you know, people interested in sharing that the, the message hit home, the message meant something to them. Mm. Maybe the message made their day, you know, and, and it's the ripple effect is so good because you paint a mural. It says you are not alone. Someone sees it. They message dear Jason, this made my day, right? Then that makes my day, mm-hmm. right? And now we've got a ripple happening. And then hopefully I go do something with that feeling. I, mm-hmm. I go paint something or say something to somebody or even like write a message to somebody and it makes their day. And like yeah. this ripple can become a cycle, you know? Yeah. And that's the best part. Yeah, it's, it's the currency. So it's like you're saying, I like the validation, I don't need it, but it is currency. Mm-hmm. And as artists, we're constantly giving. You know, a lot of the work that we do, we're, we're just putting it out there just to give it, to give it, to give it. And it's really hard, I have found, I'm very bad at receiving. I'm getting way better. I've been working on it, work in progress. But getting some of those messages back is us receiving that back and that gratitude to re-energize us to continue doing the message. Mm-hmm. So looking at it that for that. And the ripple effect. Huge. It's smart. It's smart that you mentioned that you're like getting better at receiving it, you know? And I, I actually have deliberately thought about that and and I'm working on it as well because it's I think it's my nature to want to be humble and be like, oh, no, it's nothing. You know, someone's like, oh, this mm-hmm. is great. And you're like, nah, it's no big deal. Like, because you def- you deflect it because you don't know how to receive mm-hmm. the love, right? And so instead of deflecting it, I'm working on this. Obviously, you are too. Like, I've, I've and I've gotten pretty good at it. I welcome it and receive it. And I've learned to say, thank you, mm-hmm. you know? And it's as simple as that. You don't have to say like, oh, I, it was, uh, you know, like whatever we sputter out. I know. It's just... Thank you. And taking that moment and, and to add to that, because this is me doing the work and working on this. The whole point of live through love is like, let's be better humans and then we can help other humans be better humans. But right. when I started learning that just, just someone says, Hey, you're beautiful today. And you're like, no, you are, <laughs> you actually deflected their energy from landing on you, which took away from them also mm-hmm. and fluffed it off. And you thought by flipping it back, you were just, re-complimenting them or it, it's it doesn't seem like it's the wrong thing to do right but you didn't actually let their compliment land mm-hmm. take that moment accept the energy and that was them giving it to you so that actually re-energizes them too and then you could take a moment you know what thank you i'm receiving that and i just want to say like you look amazing in that shirt today too like don't try to say the same thing mm-hmm. but it's being conscious and not being an autopilot mm-hmm. okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna tie that back to the art because i think for both of us, I'll speak for both of us, we put all that energy, all that love into the work. Mm-hmm. And so when you put it on a wall, when you put it on a canvas, when you give it to somebody, you're giving them a piece of your heart. Like I'm giving mm-hmm. a piece of my heart. And so for someone to receive it 
And then to reach out on social media and say, this meant something to me. That's like, they've, you know, the, the piece of my heart that I've like cut out and like put mm-hmm, on the thing, mm-hmm. like they ex- accepted it and received it. And now they have that piece of me yeah. in their world or in their heart or in their mind. And then they've decided to come back and say, thank you, you know, and mm-hmm. then we have to say thank you. Right. Yeah. And, and now, now it's like another ripple happening. Yeah. No, I love that. Back yeah. to the energy exchange it's of that. the best. So, so besides that, you know, I think part of the artist's role, and I'm really diving in, I'm always like, what's, what, why am I doing this? What's the important thing about this? What is it that's different about me doing what I do, you doing what you do, other artists doing what they do? But I think the artist's role in society is to share the emotions that humans feel that other humans cannot express or share the way we do it. Beautiful. Yes. Right? Love that. And that's, that's it. That's our entire role. That's it. That is our existence and the importance of doing it. And it's not just artists painting. This is poets mm-hmm. and musicians and chefs, anyone creating in something that creates emotion for other people that can't express themselves that way, but they can receive it mm-hmm. so that they can do what they do. So beautiful. Love that. Yeah. And, and I, I think the, the expression is such a key word there, right? And it's not about painting something on a wall. That's what it is for me and you. Mm-hmm. But expressing the emotion is is so key. And I also think that as a guy, like as a white dude in America, expressing feelings is not necessarily the norm. Mm-hmm. So for me to express myself in my work and in captions talking about my work or in a podcast talking to you saying like, I'm a, I'm a white dude who likes to talk about love. Like mm-hmm. that, that is an expression that I think is important. And I think it's important for other people to see me doing it mm-hmm. and see you doing it and, and to be able to um, feel that and, and it, for it to resonate with other people who can't express themselves, like you said. Totally. And so I think it's a responsibility, you know, it's beyond just like, this is what we do as creators. I think it's, it's our responsibility to help like our culture, to help the human race, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to move forward because we need to be that example. We have the power and like, we have the ability to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's saying so much like the, the ability to express something emotional is a responsibility. I agree. And I mean, you brought it up a minute ago, but as men, Mm -hmm. right. Showing up, showing emotion, being vulnerable, Mm -hmm. We're not soft. It's not about being soft. It's not about being weak. It's just about showing up and saying, look, yeah, we are sensitive and it's okay. Right. And if the youth can start seeing that, right, being examples of showing that versus let's say the examples of what we grew up in and not saying that there was anything wrong with looking at Rambo and, you know, commando and those kinds of expressions. Like that's obviously a way that men do express themselves, but now it's, what changes the world is, is being emotional and showing sensitivity and diving deep Yeah, and actually going into what is the problem? How can we cure it one person at a time? Right. And it all circles back to then the ability to open your heart and accept and love. Mm-hmm. So dark moments. Yeah. We all get so I saw this coming. I go in lulls. I mean, <laughs> what led me here? I was... I was in depression, not even realizing I was depressed because okay. I'm like, I'm in LA at the time I was single, successful, making money, no baggage. You know, I can't be depressed. Well, what is depressed? Depressed is for sick people or crazy people or poor people like the, the stereotypes, right? The, the negative stuff, which man, I know more people with less that are so happy, especially from, from traveling. But I didn't realize, like, I was depressed and, and I wasn't feeling like I was enough. And, and that what, that's what led me to start doing this. I had mm-hmm. to do the work on myself to share it with the world and be like, this is how I'm going to fix myself. So how are you going through your dark moments? And of, as creators, it's, it's also very lonely. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah, man. I mean, that's interesting to hear. And it's, it's also, like, not surprising. Everyone has, I think everyone has their dark their dark spots. Mm -hmm. And it's important to, to like, if you have a dark moment or, or a dark part of your life, it's important to move through that and, and to learn from it and use it. And it's like, I love knowing that about you. I'm totally not surprised to hear you say that. And, and in my opinion, like the best people have had the the worst times, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's why they're the best people. So 
I'm not saying go out and have a terrible time and, you know, be depressed or whatever, but, uh, I am saying, I think that, um, embracing the challenges that, that you have, like it can, can help you and, and can uh, move you through darkness and into the light, into a colorful place, into mm-hmm. a happy place. So for me, um, I mean, I think that being honest with myself is, has been a big thing. Mm-hmm. Like being honest with who I really am and what I really want and then doing the things that align with that honesty is the best way that I've learned to feel whole, Mm. to feel like myself. And that's all easy to say, you know, like be honest with what you want. Like, what, what do you want? I want to make rent this month or, you know, like (laughs) I want to take care of my family or I want a Lamborghini, like whatever your wants are, like you've got to be really honest about who you are and what you want and then do the things that align with that. So if you want to have uh, a, a physically healthy life, then, and that's a, that's a legitimate thing that you're striving for. Then you'll feel happy if every day you work out. Like if you want to, if you want to have a, uh, a mentally healthy lifestyle, then you need to f- like think about what are the things that like what defines a mentally healthy lifestyle. And I would say that a mentally healthy lifestyle includes physical physical health, right? So I would say for, and I'll speak for myself. My mentally healthy place includes a daily routine of exercise. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not worried about having like a massive muscular physique. I don't care about that. I do care about feeling physically well. Mm-hmm. And so exercising every day helps me to get there. And that in turn helps me to feel mentally well. Mm. And then it's, it's also about, about being honest with, with what I, I want to accomplish with my life and my work. Like I want to make people feel happy. I want to spread love so that people feel good about themselves. And I've made a list of like, how can I accomplish that? Here's some things I can do to accomplish that. Many of those things on that list are, are things to create. Mm -hmm. And so I know that if I create those things that I'm going to make a difference in other people's lives, and then that's going to make me feel happy. And so I have to do those things in order to maintain my own mental health. Mm -hmm. And so all of this is to say this formula for my success for formula for my mental well-being is what I've put together as a way to, to move through the dark spots in my life. Mm-hmm. And now I know that by ma- maintaining those things, I can keep things, the brightness that I want mm-hmm. them to be at. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. Physical fitness is part of my thing. As I told you, I, w- I was pre-med, so I was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. And I played three sports growing up and I competed in CrossFit. So I've always been very physical and skateboarded and biked and hiked, all those things. So it was very important that I stay physically active, but that is how I get the junk out of the head, Mm -hmm. right? The aesthetics is a byproduct. Mm -hmm. I do it for that. And because I want to play with my grandkids one day, I Mm -hmm. want longevity. And also painting a mural is hard. The physical toll on our bodies, (laughs) like, you know, knees hurt, back hurts. Yeah, shoulders work out. 35,000 steps walking back and forth on a 20 foot wall. Yeah. Right. And the up and down the ladders and the lifts. But uh, it's also the fact that, it's okay to have dark moments too, though. Yeah. We're humans. It's yeah. part of the human experience. But doing the work, putting in the reps just like you do it in the gym, gets you actively to get out of the dark lulls quicker. Yeah. You're not in them as long. Yeah. You know, it used to be like, oh, I was in the dark for two years. Now it's like, you know what? I'm going to have my 24 hours. And it's okay. It's only 24 hours. It's not two years. Yeah. Let me Let me add to that. And I, I've kind of talked through my own formula, but I think that universally for anyone who's in, in a dark, either a dark day, a dark moment or a dark path, mm-hmm. using your hands is a, is a really like mm-hmm. important way to move through the, those things. And it, for me, using my hands means a can of spray paint or like an iPad and a stylus, you know, something like that. For, for someone else, it could be chopping. For someone else, it could be um, building something, it could be clay. It could be getting ice out of the freezer and throwing it at the wall. Like, yeah. you know, could be a tennis racket. The point is like using your hands is a, is like kind of like a universal way to say it too. It's like using your hands is a way to distract yourself from whatever is there. Even if it's just for a second, you know, it doesn't have to be for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. It can be for five minutes, but using your hands is like a, is like a tried and true way to pull yourself through something that may be a little darker than you want it to be. Mm. So that's my word of wisdom for the darkness. Use your hands, do something with your hands. 
It also keeps you off your phone. Yeah. Because we're not talking about using your hands to scroll Instagram. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't on the list. <laughs> yeah, use your hands for something like physical, manual, you know. Mm. So what else do you have going on? So um, I've got a couple of murals that I'm excited about. Uh, I'm headed to the Titan Walls Mural Festival uh, in a couple weeks, and that's in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Super hyped about that. Uh, Mural festivals for me are big because you get to do whatever you want. So as simple as that, it's like, here's a wall. It's usually a pretty big wall, and it's just go paint something. Mm. And as you know, I do a lot of commercial work, so um, which I love, and I, you know, that's great, and I'm very blessed to do a lot of commercial work. But with commercial work comes an art director, a client, um, constraints, mm-hmm. a process, an approval team, you know, and, and there are complications. So it's not always exactly what I want to do, and it's not always the most simple, direct path. Mural festival is just go paint something. Mm. So I'm hyped about uh, the Titan Walls. That's coming up. Uh, And I also have a really big commercial job. Speaking of commercial work, I have a commercial project that's coming up. I cannot give details. I'm not sure when this podcast is going to drop. Here's what I can share. It's a football team. It's my first athletic collaboration. And uh, it will be pretty public, so everyone will see it. And I'm super hyped. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Yes. Can't wait to show it off. So those are those are kind of the two big things. And then I guess I should mention the figurine, right? Yeah, let's talk about that. For those on video, you'll be able to see it. But let's talk about the evolution. How how'd you create the open heart character? So okay, so backstory on the open heart. Um, one of the first murals that I ever painted in life years and years ago uh was a Beatles lyric that said, All you need is love. And on the mural, I painted, of course, the words, all you need is love. And I painted this colorful heart. And I thought the heart looked kind of generic. So I painted a black heart on top of the colored heart. And then I really liked the way it looked. It didn't mean anything. It was just a heart. And the next mural I painted, I was like, oh, maybe I'll, it was probably something love related, right? I was like, maybe I'll do another one of those hearts. And, and next thing I knew, I was enjoying painting these hearts that were this layered thing. And it was a, basically, it's a colorful heart. And by colorful, I always mean there's like some gradients, which I love, and then some like solid parts. And then there's this black heart on top of it. And and for me, using a lot of black in my work is representative of the balance of the dark and the light and, mm-hmm. the, you know, the negative and the positive. And we could talk more about that later. But the open heart or the, the heart just became this thing that I kept doing. And so I decided that it was going to become this ongoing motif that I would integrate. And as I started to integrate it, I started calling it open heart. Mm. And at the time it was sort of like this donut, like there's a, there's a hole in the middle, you know, but as I, as I kept working with it, I realized what the heart means to me is that there is room for more, there's room Mm. for growth, there's room for change. And so I wanted the, the hole in the heart to be about space for more, you know, as I explained earlier. So that, that was kind of the evolution of the open heart. And that happened over the course of a year or two. And then as I realized this open heart is starting to have legs, not literally, but like it's starting to, to grow and evolve, I wanted to make it into a character. Mm-hmm. And so I, I had the opportunity to, to actually start building this character with 3D Retro. And so I started doing the sketches. Um, you know, I signed, you know, signed up a contract for the project and I started sketching out what is this open heart character going to look like as an actual character, you Mm -hmm. know? And so in the beginning it was like, had sunglasses on and had a face. And then I realized like the, the character needs to have the, the hole in the center because that's the concept. Mm -hmm. So I gave it arms and legs for people on video. You can see it. And the arms and the legs have a a little bit of a a Mickey kind of Disney Mm -hmm. quality, but I made them black of course. And then, uh, he's wearing Doc Martens. Um, and so the Doc Martens, I wear Doc Martens very regularly. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like a little Easter egg to me in my own style. Mm. Uh, and the character now, this is four years later, the character has evolved. Open Heart as a character has lived in a 12 foot sculpture in China. It's lived on a Louis Vuitton bag. Like it's been on a boat in New York and mm-hmm. it, like it's been, it's lived this life, you know, and now I, it's exciting that like Open Heart has been in all these places and now here it is as yeah. the toy. As a figure yeah. for people to enjoy. Yeah. And then who knows? Go on adventures. Yeah. And then, you know, let's pop over to NFTs real quick. Okay. Let's go. 
NFTs are all the craze, right? We're, we're both working in the spaces. There's early on stuff. There, there's what's happening now. And then there's the complete future. Right. I believe it's the future of art. It's not a, a either or. It's both and. It's an right. addition to what we're doing. I also, what I fell in love with the NFT is really the authentication of my physical work with the digital work. And that's my most recent drop is actually tying the two together. Right. Um, but, you know, what's your high level opinion on NFTs and how has it affected your creative practice? Well, I mean, high level, I think it's an amazing uh, extension of of the world of art. And I'm, I'm hyped that it's provided opportunities for artists who may not have other places to to show their work and sell their work. So Mm -hmm. I think that's great. You know, any new Avenue for artists, I think is always a good thing. Um, for me, the, the technology has been interesting because I work digitally. I'm very digitally native and Mm -hmm. obviously like starting out as a graphic designer, digital tools are very comfortable for me. And so before NFTs, my, my process included a digital process because I'll do sketching on iPad and, and some of my planning is digital. And then I will go and, scale up and paint, you know? Mm -hmm. So before NFTs, that digital portion of my process just was that, was that a process? It was just a thing that I did to get to the end goal. Mm -hmm. And now what I love about the NFTs is that I can take the digital portion of my process and turn that into a final piece, which can go live on the blockchain Mm -hmm. and it can be its own thing. You know, it can, it can be animated. It can have a little life of its own or it can be attached to a physical thing and mm-hmm. authenticate the physical thing. But either way, it's it's become like a new a new life for my digital process. And, and I think that's exciting because now it puts more value into the, that portion of the process. Instead of whipping out a digital sketch for my painting, mm-hmm. I can think, all right, I've got two things happening at once here. One will be a painting. One will be an NFT. So I've got to, I've got to plan this digital piece out well, and then it'll go both worlds yeah what's cool about it so you you're let's just call you digital first i'm very physical first Mm -hmm. and then incorporated the other way around like i'll do the digital render to mock up the physical piece but to me it's i'm physical Mm -hmm. so but i have a lot of pieces like that kobe over there the flag those were digital i only created them digital right but i don't know why in my head and i think this is the big conversation around NFTs is even I devalued my own digital work, even though I spend just as many hours, yeah, you know, <laughs> sitting there tinkering away. It's just like, why is one worth more than the other? Or what is the conversation about on that? Have you noticed that? Or, or how do you play the role between the two? I mean, I think it's funny that you said you devalue your own digital work and it may be I don't know. Like it's not, cause it's not about the time spent. Like value mm-hmm. is not attached to, to hours, right? We know that, but it's easy to calculate it that way. It's yeah. easy to like wrap your head around it when you put it in those terms. But the digital, I think the way that I've kind of resolved that is by using the technology to maximize with the work. It's like, if you're going to paint a wall, bigger is better, right? Oh, yeah. Cause the point is it's public art. You're trying to spread a message to the world. Let's as big as we can go. That's mm-hmm. the best way to do it. Right. With the technology for NF, you know, in NFTs, it's like, how can we use the technology to maximize this piece since it's going to be the same size on a screen regardless. Yeah. So for me, that means how can I like animate, you know, change colors throughout the, the loop of the piece so that the impact is greater. Cause ultimately what I'm trying to do is maximize impact. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying it has to be the loudest possible design or the most maximalist design, but what I want to do is express myself and communicate to the biggest audience and, and communicate something that's going to hit home the way I want it to. Mm-hmm. And when with technology for me, animating the piece is the way to do that. Yeah. So then it's like, if you have a mural, you, you have this moment where you walk up to a mural and it's like in your face, like that same thing, maybe you can accomplish with a little bit of animation that before, you, you know, you mm-hmm. couldn't. I think to me, it's not the time thing so much. It's more the physical execution, but it's just funny. It's a conversation I had and, it's, yeah. you know, it brings it up and it's all part of the process. It's yeah. all part of the the future. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the physical first mindset, You know, because like for you, let me ask you a question. Like when you conceptualize a piece, where does that, what's the first thing that happens? Like obviously it starts in your head, right? But then what's, where does it go from there? So it pops into my head 
And a long time ago, I used to sketch a lot. I had piecing books and all that. I don't draw like I used to anymore. And then from there in my head, I start thinking and thinking. And then I'll go into Photoshop. I'll open up Photoshop and I'll start layering things together. Like even some pieces that are just my layered loves. I could just do that, do that, do that, change the colors and it's new. But I always move the layout. Even the layout change, just like I paint my freehand versions. They're always going to be a little bit different. The size is a little bit different. And I'll just start playing with that, and then I go by what feels good to me. Mm -hmm. Do these colors dance well together? Mm -hmm. Does this feel good? Does it look, you know, aspect ratios and rules of three? Like, there's all these rules that I never knew. I just naturally had them or gravitated toward them, right? I've had people that have MFAs and like, dude, your color theory is like insane. And I had to go Google what color theory was and like figure this thing out, you know? It's amazing. I I knew nucleotides, electrophoresis and the Krebs cycle, right? People have to go Google that, but that's just how, you know, energy is made and and cells replicate and the energy to you extend for a muscle to do what it does. So it's all interesting what we learn, don't know, what we innately have in us. But a lot of it is by feel. It pops into my head. What's going to feel good? Start laying it together until it feels right mm-hmm. and moving it. And sometimes I'm frustrated. Like, I just can't nail this thing down. I got to close it, go away, mm-hmm. and come back later. And, mm-hmm. like, that's what was missing. It's just one little thing. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of. Yeah, and the innate, it's like the aptitude for it, right? Like, I, I have that same co- uh, comment with color a lot because I don't, I mean, I did study art and everything, but I was not, I haven't done, like, a ton of research into mm-hmm. color theory. I hadn't. Um, and I have since because of my book. But. Um, I, I just like, I, I go by, by the gut, you know, like Mm -hmm. whatever feels right. That's the thing, you know, but interestingly, like going back to the whole commercial world and like the corporate, the corporate system, I think it's important for artists to be able to learn to articulate Mm -hmm. those things because saying like, it just feels right. That doesn't resonate, you know, especially if there's a lot of money at stake. And so I think it's like you and I could say, I like, how'd you get there? It just felt right. Yeah. And I, and you say that to me and I'm like, totally, I know exactly what you're talking about, but the rest of the world might not understand that. So we have to learn how to articulate, mm-hmm. like, why did you put the pink there or what does the red represent, yeah, you know? Totally. And that's helpful, I think, in selling the, selling the work, you know, yeah, and, and helping people to understand the work and telling the story. Yeah. What well, feels right to us. Then we go present it. The presentation's a different ballgame. Yeah, yeah. So learn to present your work. Yeah. So top three tips for a young creative. Okay. Top three tips for a young creative. One, use your hands every day. Mm -hmm. Two, don't look at other people's work too much. Just stay in your own lane. And then number three, figure out a way to infuse kindness, love, positivity into your workflow, even if it's just self-love, even if it's a matter of just telling yourself every day that you love yourself Mm -hmm. or that complimenting yourself, taking a second to look at something you made and say to yourself, that's awesome. You know, it can just be self-love, but figure out a way to infuse some sort of positivity and love into your, into your workflow. Mm. Self-love's huge. So it's one of the pillars of, of live through love. Yep. Kindness to yourself, you know, like you can't, you can't beat yourself up and then go be kind to other people. Right. Know. The world's already going to be unkind. Why are you also going to be unkind to yourself? Yes. Right? yes. It, it's so easy. Yeah. And you know, I, I always say this too, like, um, this whole concept of being kind, like it's like, you can, you'd be surprised at how far you'll get in life just by being nice to other people. And then people hear that as mm-hmm. like, Oh, you're a doormat. Like people are going to step all over you. And I'm like, no, no, because I'm kind to myself. Like I have self-respect I'm kind to myself, which means if you mistreat me, I will stand up for myself. Mm. I'll do it firmly and kindly, but I will not let you walk all over me. Yes. That's kindness to myself. And it starts there. Yes. No, well said. Favorite artist right now? Ooh, that's so tough, man. Right. Um, you can name a few. So I'm going to name, I'm going to name Tristan Eaton. He's I name great. him a lot, actually. Solid guy. Very, very impressive artist. And I just painted a mural on the 3D retro building and he has a mural on that same building. So I was looking at his work. I'm, I'm painting my stuff, looking at his work. And that guy's such an impressive craftsman mm-hmm. with a spray can. Like what he can do with a spray can is like what no one else can do. Mm-hmm. So I'm sitting here painting this mural, right? And his work is right there. And I have this feeling of like, 
dude, this guy's like one of my heroes and I'm painting right next to his work. Like oh, yeah. that's huge. So let me, let me shout him out. Um, and then also on the building is, uh, Dave Persuay and Persuay also amazing work mm-hmm. and he's such a nice guy. So uh, let me shout him out too. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big Tristan fan. And my favorite question, how do you define living a life through love? I think living a life through love is a matter of honesty with yourself, integrity, meaning doing what you say you'll do, and sharing, which is obviously complimenting other people, giving something to other people. It could be your heart, could be your words, mm-hmm. could be your time. And that formula, I think, is the way you live through love. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, you for joining us. Yeah, man. And so happy to be here with you. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad it worked out. <laughs> yeah. Everything we did. It's amazing. People don't realize like the efforts we go to put people together. And like I really want to share the people I put on this show and the the in-person experience. Yeah. Like I, I'm glad you were here physically. It's yes. just a different conversation. So thank you. Yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm glad it worked out. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, there's a lot of firsts. First time seeing your studio. First time since you became a father Mm -hmm. and uh, first time on the podcast, man. Yeah. So I hope that this is the first of many. Of course. Collabs are coming. We got to do the mural collab. We've been talking about it. Yeah. The first, so now we have, now we have two firsts that are on the way, which is the first LA mural Mm -hmm. together and the first New York mural together. We're going to make it happen. This is going to make it real, real. Let's go. We did have a pandemic that kind of got in the middle of it. We were on the path actually, because we even have renderings, remember? Yeah. Like we were about to, we were about to do it and we got derailed, but we'll, we'll get it. It will. So where can everyone find you? On Instagram, Jason Naylor and... I think start there. You can find everything else from Instagram. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.